Today uh, we will uh, discuss in this lecture um, uh, the events, developments and uh, important processes that have shaped uh, Central and Eastern Europe <coughs> in the period between 1500 and 1800. This lecture will have two parts, two major parts, um, in which we will deal with uh, different uh, countries. Um, Again, what I'm trying to do in the, in the video lecture is to point out certain processes and phenomena. If this is a video lecture, it's not uh, a replacement, um, it's not interchangeable with your readings. So, uh, you know, you can choose either one or the other. Right? This is, the, the lectures are meant to um, explain things, uh, to point out certain important aspects, uh, to um, show uh, certain connections so that you can better understand the materials that we are using otherwise right uh, and so you can't uh, <clears throat> just like you would have it in a in a classroom classroom lecture uh, therefore you you know what you're getting in the video lectures is is uh, unique information and you're expected to be familiar with it but also with uh, the information contained in the other materials so the period, obviously, this is sort of ambitious, actually it's 1400 to 1800, of course. Um, this is sort of an ambition, ambitious uh, overview in a way, right? Um, because it is a, a long period, it covers the end of the Middle Ages, Renaissance, up to early modernity. Uh, many, many things change. But we are trying to, to do an overview, a review of the important things. Uh, so. Let's, let's see first what are some of these uh, common uh, phenomena or events and then see how they play out in, in uh, different countries. Of course you have more information and you will have, uh, you have more information in the, in the uh, more factual information in the textbook, in the fruit textbook. So uh, what do we need to know? So uh, this is the height of the Middle Ages, the end of the Middle Ages, basically a renaissance is happening uh, towards this time, <clears throat> 1400 and thereafter, and many of the countries we, have, we are studying will uh, uh, go through the, uh, their period of glory just around, uh, just about this time. So this is when uh, they were, uh, for example, Poland and Hungary will be some of the biggest states and the most influential, powerful uh, states in Europe, as the map will indicate. Uh, so. That's one thing. So some of them will have statehood and will dominate uh, many areas that will be important powers. The second thing is that this is also the period that started in the early 14th century, 1300s, right? Uh, but it will really reach its apogee um, in the 16th century. Uh, and, uh, and the process I'm referring to is the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. From the southeast, it will go through the Balkans, through southeast Europe, through eastern Europe, to the southern Slav uh, peoples, and it will push towards, uh, you know, basically towards the start of the gates of Vienna, uh, Austria, right? So this is the other process, and it will definitely, uh, uh, tremendously shape the history of the region, and this power portion of the history of the region. Uh, in fact, the key moment in this period is, is 1526, the famous Battle of Mohac. There were many battles before that, but this was the battle in which uh, many of these Central European armies, well, armies of the people's uh, states in Central Europe, will suffer a, a crushing defeat. And that will be kind of uh, the end of their resistance to the Ottoman expansion. Uh, and after that, for uh, uh, even, even even Hungary will be for about 160 years under Ottoman occupation. This wasn't just the extracting, uh, you know, tribute, but it was actual occupation. But we'll look at this thing, how, how, this, how this thing happens, right, um, in, more, in more detail. But this would, that's around, you know, 1520, 150 years of Ottoman occupation, say in Hungary, so by Towards the end of the period we're studying, right, 1600, end of 1600s, i.e. 17th century, you have the beginning of the retreat of the Ottoman Empire. So this, it's during this period that you'll have the height of big Central European states 
then the expansion of the Ottomans, who will be fought successfully several times by all these countries, I told you that's one of part of their common historical memory and part of their identity is to be the defenders of Europe, so to speak. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yet, uh, you know, not being able to withstand it, uh, you know, uh, failing uh, eventually. Uh, and then being uh, a, a large part of this being occupied, but especially the Balkans, especially the Southern Slav peoples being for centuries, uh, right, we talked about uh, the Serbian history and the traumatic event that was the Battle of Kosovo in 1389, right, in the previous period we have examined, and how uh, after that uh, the Serbians will be under uh, uh, Ottoman occupation for 400 years, even 500, right? So such, uh, uh, such, traumatic, such traumatic events would be a common heritage of this area, sorry. Um, but especially for the Southern Slavs, for the Southern, Southern Slav people, um, uh, this will be, uh, this will shape their history even more so than the Central Europe. So Eastern Europe will be shaped even more so than Central Europe than by this. Because in Eastern Europe, especially in the Balkans and among the Southern Slavs, the Ottoman Empire will last for indeed four or five centuries. It will reach as far as Central Europe and say Hungary, but it will retreat after about 100, 150 years, still leaving marks. But in the south, uh, in what will later become Bosnia, they, it will be, those areas will be uh, intrinsic part of the Ottoman Empire. And, and the fate of the Slavic people there, of the Christians there, uh, and I'm saying this with a specific uh, reason because it was the important part in how they were treated, uh, their status. Uh, seasonal uh, things. Um, so for these people in the, in the south, southeast, this will be, this will definitely shape their uh, uh, existence, their self-understanding self and identity. So, uh, towards the end of the, 16th century, uh, of the 17th century, 1600s, uh, the Ottomans are pushed back. Well, are pushed back by, by who? Especially this, new, this newly emerging, or not so newly, but emerging and even more spreading power of the Habsburgs. So here's the other, here's the other force from the, from the West. The Habsburgs were an uh, Austrian-Germanic uh, family. Well, but, uh, who uh, at different points in European history, uh, members of the family held the thrones of Spain, of uh, Netherlands, of so you know it's just a family, uh, but who will become associated uh, historically with with the, the the throne of what will later become Austria, right? And uh, Austrian Empire will be actually the Habsburg Empire. Um, so this is the force that pushes from the from the West. And as we'll see in the case of Hungary, Hungary at a certain point uh, will cease to exist as a state, just like Poland later will cease to exist as a state because it will be under occupation of, but more so than Poland, the under occupation, under uh, divided between the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire. Okay, but these two occupations are very different. Right? In the Habsburg Empire, the Hungarians had their own status and so on. Okay, so three major phenomena. You have a, a periods of, of, of you know glorious statehood for several of the Central European states, uh, and withstanding the pressure from the Ottoman uh, expansion, uh, uh, and then the successful expansion of the Ottoman Empire and the control of the area in various forms. They were very different, the forms of this uh, uh, control or uh, influence, and then. Towards the end of the, these 400 years that we're talking about, the uh, beginnings of the end or retreat of the Ottoman Empire and the, in, uh, the spread here of the influence of the Habsburgs, of the Habsburg Empire. Okay, so these are the, some of the key uh, events. Meanwhile, of course, uh, there are other cultural events that happen, right? You have the end of the Middle Ages, you have the Renaissance, rediscovery of humanism, uh, you know, in the sense of the, of the classical uh, Greeks and so on. Uh, you have Reformation, which will have a huge impact on the area, uh, Protestant Reformation, uh, especially on Central Europe, right? not on the 
Eastern Orthodox lands who were not affected by Reformation. Reformation was a process that happened within the Catholic Church. It was not, it was actually a Catholic uh, thing, right, uh, which eventually resulted in a different church. Um, and uh, then you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, later on the invention of print and, and uh, uh, you know, early modernity, so we're getting close to the 1800s. So there are all these cultural factors also happening. But note that if up to Renaissance, especially century Europe, kept up with these processes, the occupation by the Ottoman Empire, uh, which kind of insulated them from the west of uh, Europe, or even some of these lands from the west of Europe, stopped this cultural development, stopped in general the development of these societies. We're going to discuss a little bit why and how. But it stopped the development, so there, there was a sort of a lag, therefore, in the in keeping up with uh, certain social, political uh, developments in the in the West and, and uh, you know probably cultural, so there will be and even more so in the lands to the south that were intrinsically part of the Ottoman Empire. Because, you know Ottoman occupation was manifested differently. So there, you know, they will be completely insulated from the phenomena. So there, there will be this disjointedness from these developments that will. That, uh, from the Western European developments that will manifest itself, which will, again, we uh, will uh, will remain to a degree, but will be uh, uh, made up for after the retreat of the Ottomans from the Central Europe. But in Southeastern Europe, remember that uh, in the in Serbia, Bosnia, Bulgaria, or today is Serbia, Western Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire will not leave until the end of the 19th century, even beginning of 20th, right? So. So it depends on where you're talking about, Albania, for example, right? So there is a, an increased, those areas will be even further behind, so to speak, in terms of, of, of all the cultural, political, and social developments that happen in the West. The Central Europe will pick up, but it will still, for example, it will remain feudal up to the 19th century, while uh, you know, there were changes, significant changes in, in the social relationships uh, in Western Europe, say in England, by the 19th century. Okay. So there will be these differences, but I'm just giving you the themes that you, when you read, you kind of will perhaps be, uh, will be able to recognize. So let's talk uh, in this la video lecture about Poland, the Czechs, and uh, uh, Hungary. And of course, we're using, you know, I'm saying Poland, but uh, you know, uh, what today we understand by Poland is not what necessarily then this name meant. Okay. So, for um, um, so there we have it in the year 1400. So we talked about the fact that Poland, um, there was a personal union between Poland and Lithuania uh, in the 14th century, um, and which means that it meant that both Poland and Lithuania had the same uh, king that the nobles in both lands elected the same king and I mentioned why this was used so you, know, you have to keep up with the lectures of course also in other important uh, political developments is that in the 15th century Poland uh, forms a two-chamber parliament but again parliament was not just, uh, just in Poland just like in any, uh, anywhere else in the, in the, in the world basically uh, in England including, including uh, England Parliament is not uh, an elected body, right? But Parliament was the representatives of the estates in the society, of the of the of the classes in society. So, so uh, there was no such thing, thing as uh, you know, obviously not everybody was equal, right? So everybody's position in society depended on their on their profession, on their uh, place, on their inherited privileges, and so on. And this becomes clearer later when we talk about the modern state. So anyway, uh, so when you say parliament, it's not like an elected body. So the same, the two house parliament, so 1416 really, two chamber parliament, with a senate and a same. And the same was the lower uh, house and the senate was the upper house. And the same represented the local parliaments where the local nobles were. Right, the Senate was uh, uh, formed of members appointed uh, by the king from high government or court officials. Uh, and, and so, smaller nobles and court appointees by the king. 
uh, in 1505, uh, there's the Nihil Novi uh, legislation, which uh, is a law which guarantees that no new laws will be made by the king without the consent of the same and of the senate. Now remember that these parliaments or sames or diets or whatever, or in, or in the Croatia, Croatian lands, it was the sabor, which was the gathering of the nobles, these were consultative bodies, right? Which the king, you know, the very idea of gathering the, key, the nobles to, uh, the king gathering the nobles was related to the need that the king had to get the support of the nobles in order to be able to control the territory, right? To impose his authority. Because there was no standing army, right? There was no standing army, there was no uh, bureaucracy that would uh, cover the entire land so that someone gives an order in the capital and it becomes implemented everywhere in the land. There is no such thing, right? <coughs> this is a modern invention. So what you had, and I explained this before, you had a center of authority which relied on local centers of authority which received different privileges. <coughs> and and when there was a war, for example, then the nobles contributed to their own <coughs> armies, their own people, and that was the army. Okay? There were some professional soldiers, but it wasn't a standing army. There were mercenaries. Um, if you've seen Braveheart, uh, the movie, then uh, you, know, you see how this happens. So each noble brings his own people. So, you know, often it was just peasants with forks, and that's the army there. Um, so, but why is this important? It's because it shows you the history, the tradition of, of, uh, of uh, political organization in Poland. And, you know, you will not be shocked when you will see that even today, what is the name of the parliament in Poland? It is the same. So, you know, these things harken back. Just like in England, it is the House of Commons and the House of Lords for a reason, because it harkens back, it's just a natural inheritor of the previous institutions. So, also, why, is this, why this is important is because it shows you again what I mentioned before that Poland, in Poland, the politically relevant actor or, or, or entity were the nobles. They were the nation of Poland. Okay? And remember, this has nothing to do with language because many of them spoke, you know, I mean, whoever was cultivated spoke Latin and wrote Latin. And that was the official language of the court and, and of the church and so on. And it's until late, right? Uh, whatever dialects different peasants speak, uh, it didn't matter, right? Um, so, so it's the nobles who are who are uh, who gain these rights. Just like with the Mar Magna Carta in, in England in twelve twelve in the thirteen hundred in the twelve hundreds, which is one well, of the first sort of a rights document. Well, it's in a way that's nonsense because it's actually the the, the nobles extracting from the king, uh, you know, privileges, right? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, they, want, they needed the king to, to maintain order and authority in a certain territory, but they also needed this authority to not be uh, absolute, right? So they extracted guarantees. So Nihil Nomi is such a guarantee. When the king agrees not to pass any legislation without the approval of the Senate and the same, it, these bodies become more than just consultative. This is important, it's part of the pride that Polish, those who consider today, themselves today Polish, take in, in the history of Poland, that it, there is this history of rights, but again, it's not the rights of the people, as it, just like it wasn't anywhere in the world. It was the right of those who mattered politically. Right? Remember that citizenship itself is a political, it's a political title, okay? Citizenship is given to you by the government. Okay? You, don't, you don't have it, you don't deserve it, you, know, you are given something by a set of institutions, right? Uh, well, at that point, not everybody had citizenship to make a parallel. Of course, citizenship didn't exist in the way we understand it today. But citizenship is basically your contract between you, between an individual and the government, okay? At that point, this contract was between different individuals and a smaller set of individuals and the government. And these individuals have, did not have the same relationship with the government, each, in, each, each of them, right? So, uh, here's the government, well, the privilege is that this noble family, or this city, or this profession, or guild, or the clergy, had the relationship between the government and this group of people, each were different. So, you know, these were the politically recognized and relevant entities, but their relationship 
with the gover governing uh, entity was not equal. Okay? But they were grouped. Like there were the smaller nobles, the, the higher nobles, this, this profession, this guild, you know, the cobblers, the whatever. Okay? But this gives you a sense of, you know, this is not the modern uh, citizenship. Okay, an important thing then is that uh, Poland and Lithuania, from being um, a personal union, eventually uh, will become eventually will become a Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth which means that they will be united administratively as well. So if there was a personal union, and it becomes a sort of a confederal arrangement with common foreign affairs, like the US Confederacy, right? The confederal, uh, the Articles of Confederation. That uh, they will have common foreign affairs, a common meeting of the different parliaments, but they will keep different legal system and different administrative systems, right? So that, uh, but still they will be closely uh, linked, uh, more closely than just to a personal union. And uh, also the king, the monarch, the king of, the, of this commonwealth was elected by the nobles and uh, the nobles who extracted additionally, uh, and every time that the king was elected he had to sign two documents guaranteeing the rights and, uh, and these privileges of the nobles. Uh, and also coming up with a, a kind of a governing platform, it was very interesting. Um, Another important uh, uh, moment is in 1596, talking about uh, you know, culture, uh, is the union of Brest-Litovsk. Now, uh, you know, uh, what then was called in Lithuania was, covers a lot of what today is Ukraine, for example, right? And there, what we call today different people like Ukrainians, Ruthenians, whatever, they were all within this, uh, this, uh, this territory, Germanic speaking. Again, whatever the peasants spoke, they didn't matter, right? Understand this. The, the, what the land was politically didn't have nothing to do with what languages these guys, these peasants, those peasants spoke, those who were cultivated spoke, wrote, wrote Latin, right? Wrote Latin. Uh, that was a common cultivated language, and the entity was political, right? The, uh, the the political the the um, uh, you know as I said the nobles were the political nation. So uh, why do I mention the union of Brest and what was it? Well, in the eastern part of Poland, remember kind of uh, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, the Eastern Orthodox um, um, peoples that kind of spreads around, uh, along this line. So this is kind of where you have Eastern Orthodox, and this is where you have Catholics, this is before Reformation, right? Uh, and this was the line. Well, it remained even after Protestantism here. Protestantism, Reformation will happen here. It's a phenomenon within the Catholic Church. Uh, but these borders, as you notice, will include, will, will, the political borders will cross these religious cultural borders. Uh, so this is why, this is how this union happens. What happens is that the Orthodox uh, Church in the eastern part of Poland, today's Western Ukraine, uh, will join the Catholic Church. Right? Remember that this was, there was a division between the original Church in 1054 was kind of was the last uh, you know straw that broke the camel's back and it divided the you know Catholic Church and many Orthodox churches, but different sorts of uh, Christianity, who did, wasn't, weren't different in terms of their teaching, or, uh, but it, they were mostly different in terms of the traditions they developed in terms of rituals. Now, in uh, 1596, what happens is that the, the Orthodox Church here joins the Catholic Church. Now, what you need to understand about the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church even today, is that the Catholic Church, Catholic means universal, right? The Catholic Church has one Hand, right, the Pope, right, in Rome, right, and so the hierarchy is very clear. There's a there's a head, and then there are uh, <coughs> cardinals, bishops, uh, and then priesthood, and so on. So it's a very clear. And this expands throughout the world. Is is this? Uh, it, it all kind of you know goes towards one top. There's one center, uh, and and it goes towards you know everywhere, right? 
Not so in the Orthodox Church, and that's very important. That Orthodox Churches throughout history have organized themselves. There is no center for the Orthodox Church. There's a kind of a spiritual center in um, in Greece, because right into Orthodox Churches were based in Constant uh, well, Constantinople, later Istanbul. That's where they originated from. Uh, that was the, the spiritual center, right? And kind of the spiritual center of it is Mount Athos today, in today's Greece. But the point is that there is no hierarchy in the same sense. There is a hierarchy, just like, you know, again, this is the same church that divided in 1054, right? So the hierarchy, priests, bishops, is the same. Both churches. But there is no pope, so to speak, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, okay? But the, the, the each Orthodox church is basically a organized along territorial lines, mostly in, in, in amidst these lines, these borders are not clear, right? When borders change, sometimes the church's organization changes as well, right? So, uh, uh, for example, uh, after the Soviet Union fell and Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union, and being part of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was kind of taken under the control of the Russian Orthodox Church, okay, for some reason, in Moscow. Now, when Ukraine became independent from the USSR, the Ukrainians wanted to, well, no, no, we always had our own church, so we'll have the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church based in Kiev, right? But some of the priests said, no, 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 we'll stay with Moscow. So after independence in Ukraine, right, so let's say this is the Soviet Union, Ukraine breaks apart, until, because it was part of one state, the Moscow took over the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Now, when it created its new state borders, then you had suddenly several churches because you had the Ukrainian Orthodox Church based in Kiev, and you had another part of the church which still responded to Moscow. So you have two Orthodox churches in the same country, right? But uh, you see that the, the, the point is that uh, the Orthodox Church in different places, uh, in the uh, Orthodox churches, uh, um, organize themselves territorially. So there is a sort of a um, head of the Orthodox Church in, let's say, Romania, let's say, Ukraine today, and so on, who is elected by the bishops of that Orthodox Church, right? So each Orthodox Church is called its autocephalus, meaning that it has its own, uh, own head. And each of these heads are sort of uh, uh, at the same level, you know, with each other. There's no, uh, you know, uh, there is the Patriarch of Constantinople has a sort of a preeminence, but it's more informal, okay? And this is very important, because you see, you see that for the Orthodox Church it matters a lot who is in power, what are the borders, and so on, right? Uh, when these borders change, then, you know, the, the whole, uh, when, when borders change, then there are uh, uh, such conflicts of reorganization, and at several times it happened that different Orthodox Churches claimed authority in the same territory, which you can't have, you know. So, uh, just to have a sense. So this is now, perhaps it gives you a sense of why these Orthodox churches here join the Catholic Church, which is, you know, has the one worldwide structure, basically, even if each in different places it's organized locally, but it has one worldwide structure, they join it. And this is very important because this gave rise to the so-called Greek Catholics. And the, the, the way they joined the Catholic Church is not that they converted, they remained they kept their ritual, um, their, 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 you know, the, the, the script is still Slavonic and whatever, and the, the Mass is said in a specific way, the liturgy, but they from now on recognized the Pope, right? And the reason why this was possible, they didn't have to convert, is because it is still considered to be the same church, the two churches, only that administratively, uh, you know, it's, uh, they're divided differently, so this is why, this is very important. This is very important because the same mechanism of creating the Greek Catholic Church, which is now part of the Catholic Church but has its own uh, different, uh, its own traditional liturgy, right? Um, this will be applied in several of these places which are at the border between Western and Eastern Christianity. And these will also give rise to huge political conflicts and debates, including even today in these lands. Because the Orthodox in these lands will consider these as being traitors, in a way, right? Uh, and, uh, well, and so on and so on. So you see, I mean, major problems, uh, for example, after communism fell, what is the status of these churches? But we'll talk about this, but 
This is the origin, just to give you a sense. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in the 17th century, um, you see that the process in Poland, uh, Lithuania is, so let's go to you know, 1650. And you will see that um, in, in, in uh, Poland, Lithuania, which notice it's one of the largest states in Europe. Right? In Poland, Lithuania, as I said, there was this process of the nobles acquiring increasingly more power versus the king. They elected the king, and whenever you know the nobles get to elect the king, that means that the central authority is weaker. Whenever you have a dynasty, this is different from having a dynasty. I'll explain that, right? Um, uh, notice that Poland Lithuania does not fall under the Ottoman occupation. Look how far the Ottoman Empire has expanded. You know, now you see it says Austria, but actually this is this was Hungary, right? It was divided. We're going to talk about it in a second. So uh, Poland Lithuania is not, but it has been involved in all these fights to uh, defend Central Europe from the Ottoman expansion. In fact, one of their kings, who at that point was also the king of Hungary dies at that key battle that I mentioned, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, so, uh, so here's, here's Poland. The nobles, however, get more and more power, and they, the problem is, okay, they have more power, that's what, democratic or whatever? No. The problem is that, how, what if these nobles have different interests? What if these nobles are divided in their opinion, or their intentions, or interests, or whatever? And that's what happens. So, uh, the no because the king is weakened by the power that the nobles had, just like we mentioned in the case of Bos Bosnia, things don't go anymore, because they don't agree to pass reforms, they don't agree to do this, to do that, remember the king has to have the approval of the senate and the same, well what if the parliament doesn't want your law, so to speak, right, well it doesn't have, nothing happens. And you have this sort of a, a situation of paralysis, which will be a curse on on, on Polish, uh, on the fate of the Pol of Poland, uh, and of in, in Polish history. So it will be famously some one of the reasons for the failure of the Polish state, which will lead to its actual destruction. The fact that 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 nobles will be so divided. You know that like, the tragedy is that we were so divided that could that because of our uh, inside in, internal division, we fell to external enemies. So that that's the idea here. Uh, 1683, uh, uh, a key moment when a European alliance led by uh, Jan Sobieski, who was a Polish military commander, uh, was elected as king of Poland and Lithuania. In 1683, they stopped the, the Ottomans at the gates of Vienna. And that's kind of the beginning of the end for the Ottoman expansion. Because you see, they were expanding towards, you know, century, you know, Western Europe and so on. But, uh, Vienna was kind of the, this is where they were finally, the, when the emperor, empire was finally stopped. Uh, uh, and that it will start retreating. Uh, let's go to 1700. Uh, in the 18th century is a time of general decline, actually, in, uh, in Poland, in Poland, Lithuania, uh, for, because of poor policies, because of poor alliances, because uh, uh, of, of the plague, because so many phenomena uh, play a role, plus influences from the outside. Tsarist Russia, now you have, you see, Russia already is a player. Uh, also, uh, Habsburg and other Germanic influence here, uh, so, and an interest in, in, uh, in Poland. Uh, and so, this decay and this lack of, 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 of uh, the ability to, to um, this economic uh, and cultural decay, and la lack of uh, the ability to act uh, with uh, forcefully. Uh, you know, even Jan Sobieski, the, fa the famous military commander who stopped the Ottoman Empire at the gates of Vienna, he wasn't able to establish a hereditary dynasty. He wanted to establish a hereditary dynasty. Now, of course, that goes against the rights of the people, and who was the Polish people? The nobles, right? So they opposed it, so he failed, and he was the great military commander, so who else would be able to do that, right? So you see this conundrum between the need for central decisive leadership and the need to protect the rights of the nation, but the nation at that point, again, remember, it was those who were politically relevant, which is the nobles, it doesn't matter what language they spoke, right? 
Um, so this is a conundrum that is still, you know, happens in, in politics, uh, happened in politics throughout history, even today. Think of the United States and the conundrum between, you know, we want the government to be decisive, but it shouldn't intrude in our lives. Well, which one do you want? The conundrum between security and freedom, right? Which one, right? The safest country is the one which is ruled by a dictatorship, right? If you agree with him, like, you know, it's the safest country. You know, no, no thief dares to steal, or so to speak, right? Uh, to exaggerate a little. So anyway, uh, so this decay will lead, and the rise of the right of the of the of other powers such as uh, uh, Habsburg, Austria, Prussia, P R U S S I, not Russia, Prussia, which is a German Germanic state here, and of uh, the Russian Empire, especially in, exactly now in the 18th century, will lead to the greatest tragedy of Polish history. Which is, uh, which is basically a process that happened between 1772 and 1795. And this is the, these are the partitions of Poland. So look at Poland here, right? One of the largest states in, if not the largest states in Europe. Right? Poland is Lithuania, obviously. And uh, now look at the... Well, let's just uh, look, at, look at Poland here. Where is Poland? 1800. Where is Poland? There is no Poland. There is no Poland. Which means that the state has been divided and been taken over by these three different powers Habsburg, Austrian, uh, Prussian, which is German, and Russian. And this uh, division happened in three stages the three partitions of Poland. And here you have a map of the three partitions. The first partition where they took part, second part, and, and then finally it was completely dissolved. Did they put up a fight? Yes, they put up a fight, but there was internal division and so on and so on. Your book talks about this. This is uh, Prussia, uh, Poland disappears. And yet the Polish nation will survive. How is this possible? How will this happen? And what will be this be what will be the impact of this process on the formation of the modern state of Poland? It will take about 125 years for it to reform. Okay? 125 years without state. So, okay, so that was uh, Poland. Um, let's talk about the Czechs. Now, remember that the Czech lands, or Bohemia and Moravia, basically. Have been have been uh, involved with the with the with the Holy Roman Empire, meaning to, with that plethora of smaller states. There it is. Of duchies and princedoms, and they were just one of them. Oh, Bohemia, there is one of them, but a relevant one within the Holy Roman Empire, which means that they have been. Uh, the history has been intertwined with the history of these Germanic states, although the Czechs are not Germanic, of course. But again, that point that wasn't that important or relevant. Now, uh, culturally speaking, uh, we need to mention here, uh, in terms of their history, the uh, Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a reformer uh, before Ma uh, uh, Martin Luther, by the way. This is before, in the 15th century, this is before, 100 years before Martin Luther. Uh, and he was trying to reform the church, which was like the Catholic Church, of course, um, uh, in uh, in those lands. But but the Hussite mov mov movement, so his the movement that followed his his teachings, was not just a religious movement. It was also so, sort of a social political phenomenon. It's it's uh, your your book mentions it, so read it carefully. But uh, just to, to point out a few elements here is that remember that in the, these Czech lands, in, this, in Bohemia, in Moravia, you know, you had Czechs, uh, like Slavic, uh, you know, nobles, and nobles who were, you know, of German language. And there was a differentiation between them and a, and a distinction and, you know, you know, at the university they spoke both, uh, you know, languages, although they, the teaching was obviously in Latin, uh, and so on. Uh, but there is a debate that erupts between, for example, the Germans and the Czechs at the university. So you see these rivalries, this sort of a tension. And this controversy is transferred in the religious realm. So that's the point that uh, 
uh, that this sort of a religious reform movement, it wasn't really just that, it was also a, a, a conflict between different groups in society. But remember, not all Czech nobles were on the side of the Hussite. Far from it, right? Prague was, if I remember correctly, uh, more on the Catholic side and uh, other uh, provincial cities were more on the who side. So it was then the peasants, peasants kind of got into the whole thing, so it became a sort of a uh, political movement. And other reform movements also came about, which weren't necessarily followers of Jan Hus, or the very movement breaks into different splinters. So it's more complex. But the point is that there was a religious reform movement that also overlapped with divisions, ethnic divisions in the society, and also overlapped with social divisions. So all of these play out and there are civil wars, basically, civil conflicts uh, happening. Jan Hus is captured and uh, eventually burned at the stake um, by the king. But in, uh, an important moment in Czech history is when the followers of Jan Hus attack the town hall in Prague. Uh, the, when the king's counselors refuse to, to, to obey their demands, they throw one of them out the window. And that is the famous defenestration, actually the first defenestration uh, throwing someone out the window, that's a defenestration, right? In, in Czech history, there will be a second one, so it becomes sort of this symbolic moment in Czech history. Uh, and an important consequence of this era is that because there was such a divided society, and the division was again not just between ethnic or religious tendencies, but it was also social, so it was uh, many things playing about, you know. Um, to, to, to reach a compromise, they needed to actually what? Compromise. And this is the beginning of religious toleration in Bohemia, uh, where the radical groups in both camps fail, and it's the middle that gains ground. And this is very important because it will shape the fate of, of, uh, of, uh, of Christianity in, in, in the Czech lands. Uh, it will also uh, kind of give uh, Czech history this sort of a uh, you know, tinge of, of rebelliousness, you know, this sort of Czech identity will be tinged with, you know, the idea of rebelliousness, you know, if you don't like it, we're going to throw you out the window, you know, sort of this, uh, you know, you know, kind of rejecting authority sort of a thing. So there's this part of, 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 of uh, Czech uh, history, but also, you know, uh, it might be linked to the fact that, for example, today, the Czech, uh, the Czech Republic is one of the most I mean, in, ter in terms of, in, in the Czech society, uh, the church attendance is one of the lowest in the world. In the world. So, one of the lowest numbers of people who declare themselves religious in the world. Okay? So, this, it does go back to these phenomena, to these, to these, uh, you know, uh, historical events. Okay. Now, uh, at several points, uh, the, Ch the Bohemian ruler, uh, the ruler of Bohemia, is shared between Bohemia and Hungary, Bohemia, Hungary and Austria, uh, uh, Bohemia, Hungary and Poland. So, you know, this sort of a checks with the Polish, with the Hungarians exchanging rulers or having the common ruler is part of their history. Uh, in 1515, a very important agreement is reached between the Jagiellonians and the Habsburgs, Jagiellons who were at that point also the rulers of the Bohemia and, but, and, and of Poland. And remember that um, uh, and this is a, an agreement by which they agree that if one of the branches, one of these two families, die without a ruler, without, the, without a successor, then the other family will provide a ruler. This was a sort of a friendly agreement to ensure that that country remains stable. Again, remember, this is the Ottoman Empire is pushing in. If you don't have a strong ruler, just like in the case of Bosnia, we talked about this, what happens? You are nobody. Right? Without a strong central government, you are nobody. So they provided this. This is very important because guess what? It's the Jagellons who die without successor and the Habsburg, this is how they get the throne of Bohemia. Now it could have happened differently. It could have happened differently and then you would have a history in which the, 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 the most important power in Central Europe would not be the Habsburgs, but maybe the Jagellons. Who knows? Who knows? Right? But the way it happened is that through this agreement, the Habsburgs get the throne of Bohemia and, and Bohemia would be dick closely associated with the Habsburg Empire from now on. This is 1550. Now, Ludwig Jagellon, who at that point was the ruler of Bohemia and Hungary, dies at that fateful battle in 1526 at Mohács uh, in Hungary. Uh, so, it's 15, uh, 1550, 
there you have it. You see, because it dies, uh, because, because of this failure, the Ottoman Empire occupies half of what was the Hungarian state and the entire part of uh, the Balkans and so on. Okay. Uh, the Czechs then, from then on, would be part of the Bohemia, rather, would be part of the, the, the Habsburg Empire. And, and, and at a certain point, one of the Habsburg Emperors would actually move the capital of uh, the Habsburg Empire from Vienna, which it had been for a long time, and would be afterwards, to Prague. Prague becomes the capital of the Habsburg Empire, one of the greatest empires in the world, uh, and uh, so on. <laughs> There's a second defenestration in 1618 when Protestant nobles, remember not all Czechs are Protestant, it's divided between the two, but anyway, Protestant nobles throw the Habsburg representatives through the window in Prague, the second defenestration. Clearly, I would say it was a hearkening back to something they already knew as part of their history that happened 100 years before. The Czechs are also involved in the Thirty Years' War, uh, which uh, ravaged throughout Europe, so it's either closely associated with all the events of the Germanic states and of, of Western uh, Europe. Um, so the 18th century, the Czech lands are part of the Habsburg Empire, um, and it is very important that the Czech lands are part of the Habsburg Empire in the 18th century, because in the 18th century you have the rise of the so-called enlightened, enlightened monarchs, right? uh, everywhere in the world, including, for example, the Russian Empire. Uh, uh, and in the Habsburg Empire, what were these enlightened monarchs? First of all, they were absolutist rulers. So absolute rulers, um, which didn't exist in the villages, by the way, but in the modernity they exist, who used this unique centralized power, including with the developments of modern more modern technology, to impose reforms throughout the land. So it was very powerful monarchs who forcibly modernized those societies. This is the paradox, you see? Oh, well, isn't it good that they were modernized? Well, it was modernized by force. Okay, so is it good or not? For example, implementing universal education by force. And by the way, because it was a half monarch, the universal education was in German. So you see the two, two sides of the issue, right? Now, in the Czech lands, because they were closely associated and under Hazard control, these reforms will be implemented. But they will, it will also, uh, because it was based in Vienna and it was very much Germanic, it meant that it will impose the Habsburg authority over the Czech lands while also modernizing the society. So, gaining on the one hand, losing on the other hand. And you'll see that this will happen differently in the case of Hungary. So, to, to conclude, the Bohemian, the Czech lands are part of the Austrian, of the Habsburg Austrian Empire, are part of this whole modernizing process uh, but look, even today, they are one of the most advanced countries in, uh, in, in, uh, in that part of the world. So, you know, uh, um, so that's, that's kind of what is the situation at 1800. But let's look at the autonomy. The well, we talk about the fact that, you know, Hungary, one of the more powerful um, and flourishing states in Europe in, in the uh, Renaissance. Uh, <coughs> one of the characteristics of Hungarian society is that gradually, well, one thing is what they had very powerful kings. So this is what allowed them to have a strong state, occupying what later will be many other countries. So, <laughs> but they were the big power in the, in, the, in the area, also creating huge resentment later. Um, um, the second thing that happens is that the situation of the peasants, it gets worse and worse in these lands. The nobles, including the petty nobles, uh, get more and more privileges, but then the counterpart of this is that the, 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 the serfs, the, 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 the peasants, had the worse and worse situation. This is why you have several peasants, peasant uprisings, very brutal ones, and you know, uh, shut down very, equally brutally. Uh, and your book mentions uh, George Doja's George Doja peasant revolt in 1514. 40,000 peasant army who were recruited in, in, uh, initially to, to fight the Turks, the Ottomans, but then they turned against the rulers. You know? Again, there was no standing army, you recruited peasants. Well, you give them arms, they might turn against you, which is what happened. But an army of nobles defeated the army of peasants and uh, your, uh, 
Georg uh, Doja was tortured and executed. This is happening in Transylvania, so it, it, both Romanian history and Hungarian history kind of claim uh, Doja as a, as a peasant hero. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, the key, uh, so there's flourishing, there's that, there, then there's this division in society, the nobles become more and more powerful, the king weakens, and that is also perhaps one of the reasons why when the Ottoman Empire, you see, is pushing forward, uh, will um, eventually win in 1536 at this uh, Battle of Mohammed. So let's go to. So uh, this is Hungary we're talking about. So Mohammed is a key moment in its history, 1526. And after Mohammed, <coughs> uh, there's the death administration. Uh, then uh, the whole Roman Empire. Uh, Hungary is basically divided, uh, disappears in a way. Uh, and uh, a large part of it will be under Turkish control, uh, Ottoman control, more sort of a, as a, looked at as a sort of a land of exploitation. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, uh, there wasn't much investment there, or there wasn't much ambition for the Ottomans to actually make this part of the core of the Ottoman Empire, unlike Bosnia, which is part of the core of it, you know. Uh, but this was kind of like a land of exploitation, more, more than anything. So, and this will last for about, what, 100 and, what, 60 years, Hungary will be under Turkish, this part of Hungary will be under Turkish rule. I mean, the consequences were tremendous. I mean, culturally, uh, cultural devastation, like people left in droves, so the, that depopulation, and, and this was, you know, and the reason why this happened, I'm going to come back to this when we talk about briefly about Serbia, Bosnia, and, and Bulgaria, the second part of the lecture, the second lecture on this topic. Um, the reason why this was so, to, to just briefly talk about it now, is that within the Ottoman Empire, the status, the, your political status depended, depended on one major, I mean, you were considered, you were grouped not by language or ethnicity or whatever, that didn't matter. It was grouped by religion. Your status was you're either a, a part of the people of God, the Muslim, uh, and they were the ones who were generally considered to be, you know, the regular citizenship. And within them, there were, you know, lower, you know, different ranks, right? Like, obviously, there was a pyramid structure. But the rest were grouped by religion. The rest were considered okay. And then you had the Christians and the Jews who were also respected as or considered to be people of the book but sort of a second-class citizen. And this meant that in the Ottoman Empire you could not climb economic, social, political ranks unless you were, uh, you were a Muslim. This is, also, this is why in Bosnia many will take up, uh, you know, the, well, that was one of the reasons, maybe some of them were convinced, whatever. The point is that those who remained Christian, you know, they were okay, they could organize themselves and whatever, but their social status remained low. They could not advance, they could not study, they could not whatever. You know, they weren't persecuted for that, necessarily. You know, I mean, they weren't killed before being Christians, uh, because the Christianity is respected, uh, you know, within, um, and was respected within the, the you know, because, uh, you know, sort of a, not as enlightened as you know, Muslim, but sort of on the right path, so to speak, right? Um, and, and this is why in these areas there was a lack of, of development. Also because within the Ottoman Empire itself there, was a, there wasn't much economic, political, social development. You know? There was sort of stagnation. This stagnation will come to a head in the 19th century when the Ottoman Empire will be crushed by the Western power. Because you won't have the same galloping modernization that you will have in the West. Right? Well, also, it also means that in these lands you won't have that either. And, you know, this will stay under Turkish control for about 160 years and then it will pick up again. But there will be lands in the Balkans that will stay under them for four or five hundred years. So they will partake in this sort of a uh, retardation of development, you know. And you're going to say, well, that's shameful that they have this economic, social, political development, whatever. But why would they? I mean, we assume that we, you need to get the latest iPhone. Why? You see? There is a cultural clash here, there's a cultural difference, right? In which we assume that if the car is faster, then it's better. Well, why? I mean, it does the car that is faster makes you happy. You know? But I'm going to go deeper into this philosophical discussion. But this is a cultural difference. 
This is a cultural difference, um, and and you know there's no absolute answer to say that oh no because we have faster cars we're happier than people with slower cars. Yeah. So uh, why in certain parts of the world this development went faster and others not, and it, how, what is this about? It's a different question. The point is that within the Ottoman Empire there was, who by the way looked down on the West. Rightly so, because the West has always been kind of beaten by the Ottomans, you know, and the Ottomans were, you know, this huge, gigantic empire over several continents. So, you know, what's, uh, you know, what should we care, worry about those, you know, uh, backward people in the West, right? But this insulation kind of also didn't expose them because there was very little circulation of culture between the West and the Ottoman Empire. There were many people traveling in and out information being carried in and out, there just wasn't that exchange. Anyhow, uh, so Hungary, a large part of it is under Ottoman rule. The western part of it, uh, the nobles here elect the Habsburgs as the king, so it's basically become part of the Habsburg Empire. But look at this yellow part, this is Transylvania. Transylvania that we cover also when we talk about the Romanian history, uh, and I told you what, right? Because Transylvania was a mixed, you know, it had Hungarians, Romanians, Germans, settlers, and other, you know, ethnic groups. But but the important part of it was was its own province. Mostly in history of, over under Hungarian influence, or is sometimes controlled or part or associated with the Hungarian crown. But from now on, for example, Transylvania would be independent. So the irony is that Hungary, uh, the, the a large part of the Hungarian state, will be either under Turkish or Habsburg rule, right? Uh, remember in the Habsburg part that the Hungarian nobles were the political body, the political nation of Hungary, they still existed, and the Habsburg ruler ruled through them. There was a parliament of the Hungarian diet, right, of the nobles, and they just gave the crown to the Habsburg ruler in the western part. But Transylvania will be independent, and it wouldn't be, it won't even, sometimes it, uh, the, the, the Ottomans will ex extract some taxes from them, sometimes they won't. So Transylvania will become actually the heartland of Hungarian culture, also remember this is many Romanians living here, uh, uh, we don't have the numbers, uh, German, German speakers and, and so on and so on. But the point is that this will become a, the heartland of, of, of Renaissance culture and of early modern culture when this land was devastated and from the, when this was under Habsburg uh, 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 control. So later when this will become part of Romania, imagine the trauma that the Hungarians will think of, uh, similar to the trauma that the Serbians feel towards Kosovo, uh, the heartland of their culture, which today is separated from Serbia. But anyway, this, uh, I'm just giving you a background to contemporary debates, to understand why today, and if you don't understand this, you don't understand what today's politics in this region. Okay, so Transylvania is actually free and flourishing. Um, and as I said, it's a uh, it Transylvania, which had Hungarians, settlers, Romanians, Saxons, Serbians, Ukrainians, many nationalities, all kinds of religions. It was multi-religious. Catholic. This is after uh, Reformation. Calvinist reform. Lutheran evangelical, because that's the evangelical church is the Lutheran church. Eastern Orthodox Jewish Unitarian Church was invented here in Transylvania. That's when the Unitarian Church was invented. Now the one that you have in the neighborhood here, Unitarian Universalist, is sort of a uh, changed version, but the original Unitarian ch uh, Church was in, came about, was invented in Transylvania. Um, but this diversity, in order for, 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 and the nobles were from all these backgrounds, right? Now in order for the rulers and for the society to be, to be to, together and to work together, there, there was established, even early on, but even now even more so, um, a system of, of reciprocal recognition and tolerance. So the Diet of Transylvania, the Parliament of Transylvania, right, which was uh, the gathering of the nobles, decrees as early as 1568 religious freedom in Transylvania. But it was religious freedom for the Catholics and the Protestants of various forms, the Calvinists or Lutherans. Not for the Eastern Orthodox, because the Eastern Orthodox were mostly Romanians, and most Romanians were peasants. So it was also a social thing. So, you know, political rights were given to the nobles. There were high nobles, petty nobles, so not all nobles were a big deal, right? But nobility were the ones who were recognized as, a, as having status in society. So the Orthodox 
most of the Orthodox speak Romanian, some Romanians were Catholic or whatever, but uh, most of the Orthodox speak Romanians. So this will remain also as a trauma for some of these peoples, notice, right, like the Slovaks. The Slovaks, who will be always part of the Hungarian state, will suffer all these changes, 